This is Behind the Mic with Brad Dalius. Behind the Mic is live from Grunion Sports Bar and Grill here in Manhattan Beach on this Wednesday evening, May the 2nd, 2018. Brad Dalius and Keith Jackson at BehindTheMicShow.com and on the official Behind the Mic app. Great to have you with us as we dive into the world of sports. Game 2 happening right now as we speak between the Jazz and the Rockets. It's a close one, actually tied at the moment. Oh, it's still tied. (laughs) <laughs> we'll see. Time. The Jazz got up big in this game. They were up by about 20 points earlier in the first half. The Rockets have made their run here in the third quarter as they've done so much as of late. And uh, it looks like it's going to be a great fourth quarter coming up. So we can't wait to dive into that one as well. That's the only NBA game going on tonight. But a lot of different news and notes from across the association today. We'll get into all of it this evening. We'll also maybe touch on some... Uh, Uh, NFL draft stuff that's left over from last weekend during hour number two and maybe get into uh, the Rams and Chargers and some of the guys they picked up in the draft as well. But again, back to Utah and Houston. Any surprise, Keith, that the Jazz were able to come out and really stick it to Houston uh, pretty good in the first half considering how last game went? And obviously the Rockets have made their run now, but still, got to be a little surprising. Uh, Maybe not for you. Not really. For me, it wasn't. I knew they were going to come out and, and try to stick it to them early because they need to get a jump out and they need to get a jump early on them. Um, you know, Houston is typically not, a, if you notice, they're not a, a first-half team. They're a team that kind of catches fire whenever they do. And usually since, since the playoffs times, it's been that third quarter, they've been really kicking into another gear in the third quarter. Can that ultimately hurt them, though, as it, we go it along? It could if they play against a Golden State, of course, because they're not catching up to that. Why? Because they have just they have more star power and more firepower than they do and better shooters. So that can hurt them in that way. But for, for this particular game right here, I mean, they could turn it on any time, as you can see. 20-point lead, they erase that. And then you got a team, you know, uh, I think – what you're seeing here is you saw, you know, Utah kind of just veer away from what they were doing is that attacking the basket. They just start settling for threes and they climb back in. James Harden and them climb back in. The more the thing is with with the with the Rockets, the more attempts you give them at the basket, shooting a wide open threes, they're eventually going to make them and they're eventually going to catch fire. So the best bet, the thing about this team is they're hot and cold. So if you can catch them in the beginning and if you can get them early and get a good lead and be able to sustain that, then that's great. I mean, you got to have a sufficient sustain. You know, going into third quarter, a 10, 10, 12, not 10, 12 point lead, that would help you a lot. So um, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't surprised that they jumped out on them from the from the gate. Um, but they need to. The Utah Jazz need to win this game tonight. I can tell you that much because you. You want to have you want the pressure to be on Houston going back to Utah, and you going two games down and going home to Utah. That's going to be very hard to come by, especially when they play you played you during the season at Utah and they beat you there. So, you know, I think you you want to you want to keep this game tied one one. You want to try to steal this game right here. Yeah, if you go down 0-2, I mean, history tells us uh, it's extremely difficult to come back. There's only a handful of series, actually, in the history of the NBA playoffs that it has gone the other way after a team gets up two games to none. That's why Game 2 was so big last night, I thought, for the Pelicans and the Pelicans-Warriors series. To They got off to a good start. We talked about it during the broadcast last night from Patrick Malloy's. It was a close game, which they needed to do, but they used so much effort, Keith, as we talked about to build that lead, whereas Golden State, 
was right there. Yeah. Even after taking the hardest punch possible from a good Pelicans team, but again, it just wasn't enough, and they fell short last night. That's why I think even though they're down 0-2 and – you, I know we talked about it before tonight's show off there. You think they can get a game in New Orleans? I think they can get a game for the simple fact is, you know, and I think they'll probably probably get game three, um, which is the next game. I think they'll get game three. I think Golden State will go back and focus in and get game four, and they'll end it in game five. But the thing is, what was so crazy about the Golden State Pelican game was, you know what I looked at? I looked at just – the Pelicans couldn't play no better than what they played. I mean, right. they had they had double, triple, they had uh, double figure scoring from Anthony Davis, double figure scoring from Drew Holiday, and then double figure scoring from Ray John Rondo. And I said that on I remember saying that that those three have to really do something in order for those guys to really have a chance. And I mean, and they still got beat by. And I mean, it was in Golden State didn't play well. But you know who's keeping them in the game and what I'm starting to notice is Draymond Green. Draymond Green is the one that's kicking Golden, uh, Pelicans' tail. And the Pelicans know that. So what they're trying to do is to get into his head and mess with him. You saw the tangle-up situation that happened earlier with him and Anthony Davis. And that led to a double foul. And then you had Ray John Rondo jump in his face and, and that and push his chest. They're trying to get to him and get in his head because they know that's the really the engine that's that's letting that team go right now. So And he's know. been doing this for a while now, Green. Yeah. Honestly. Not just in this series, I don't think, but why does he run under the radar so many times, Keith? I think that's the thing that amazes me the most that Draymond Green has played at a high level for this team for a long time. We know about his antics with technical fouls and being suspended in past games, past critical games for this team Mm -hmm. in the past couple of years. But he continues to play at a high level regardless of the situation that he personally finds himself in or wherever the team may be in, whether the team is down a player like Curry, whether they're out with, you know, there's no head coach, no Steve Kerr for a particular game. He continues to be the constant that beats the drum there for them. And... It is amazing how nothing seems to really bother him. Yeah, I mean, uh, one thing about it is what you start to see is they do players, you know, they know that they can get into his head, but and he's a loose cannon sometimes, and he can hurt you. But I think he's learned from that game five when a couple years ago when they lost the championship and they know they could have won that one, the first one they went, when they, I mean, the second one they went, that back-to-back. Yep. And I think he's learned from that. But, you know, and then again, you, you see like, well, maybe they haven't because then you see him and Kevin Durant pop off again. They have just amount, the same amount of text during the whole season and stuff. And you see that happen. But Draymond Green's a passionate player. I think he's matured a little bit and knows that his team needs him in order to be successful. And he's really a, a factor on the team, man. I mean, Steph Curry and... and Kevin Durant going to do what they do, but Draymond Green is that third person that really keeps that the interior part of the game, the interior defense, the interior offense, the the double doubles he puts are really crucial. So, yeah, he's a really important piece of the puzzle in, in terms of their success. What do you make of the Charles Barkley Draymond Green situation from last night on the air? That's hilarious. I mean... We get too serious. I think they get too as, serious. In general. Yeah, Charles, we all do. Well, like, we as a society, I think. Charles Barkley is going to say what he's going to say. It goes back... You know, Charles is going to say what he's going to say. And, and that's how Charles is. Like, at the end of the day, Charles is just joking around and playing. He's having fun, talking to his guys. Nothing serious. And I think we took they take it too serious and took it to the point where dang even the mother got involved and everything like yeah, that. Yeah, tweeting at him. I mean, you know, like, like come on, yeah. man. Like guys, like this. You guys are your son is getting paid how much money? Millions of dollars, and you got. I think this goes got, back to the yeah. conversation we had last night with fans and players, or fans and uh, family, and you know, however you want to kind of shape that up there. Uh, there just has to be a point in time where fans or players rather just have to understand that how much they're getting paid, their role in the team, and they can't worry about all that stuff. Yeah. Russell Westbrook with the Utah situation, and here Draymond Green going up against a former player. Yeah, uh, it, it's just you know, 
well, let it play out. Water yeah. off a duck's back, sort of say. I mean, really? you, you know what I mean? Like, just like I, I, it just it amazes me how sensitive some of these guys have gotten. Yeah, in sports, it really, really has. It it does, but it doesn't. I mean, with social media now, obviously, and really how that has opened up more sensitivity uh, because people are just hearing things left from right now nonstop. There's no end to it. But uh, really, you just you have to let it go off your back. I really believe that. Uh, and, uh, yeah, Draymond Green took it a little bit too seriously. The yeah. fact that he has to comment on it in his post game, just let that go. Yeah, there was no need for that. Exactly. Like, come on, guys. 92-91, Utah up on the Rockets at the moment, just under nine to play. Meanwhile, out east, Ty Lu said today in his press conference, the shoot-around for the Cavs, that he's going to stick with Kevin Love at center for Game 2, Keith, against Toronto. They're not going to go with Tristan Thompson. He's going to continue to come off the bench. Even though Love has struggled in this series, they're going to go with him. Do you like it? I mean, I, yeah. I you, you do? He's a double double guy. I mean, that's what Lou t- Lou's go- is going off of. He's played ball. It's like, look, he's an all star. He's an all star. He's a double double. He puts up double. He's a double double guy. You got to keep him on the floor. He's a he's the second guy next to LeBron. Tristan Thomas is not going to give you what he gave you before fourteen points a game. All that he ain't going to give you that every game. Kevin Love is capable of doing that though. So you got to go with him, and you got to. You got to stick with that. Um, Do you think it would have been different if they would have lost Game One? No, I don't even think he still would have stuck with him. Still stuck with him. You you got to. He's a he's an All Star. You know that's what it comes down to. The guy's an All Star. You pay him a lot of money, um, and he needs to step up when he needs to step up. It's the same thing as like, look, let's say LeBron James was having a horrible series, horrible series, wasn't doing anything. Do you sit? Do we sit LeBron James on the bench? Absolutely not. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Well, a little different with LeBron. Well, no. Seven straight finals? Yeah, seven straight finals. But look, Kevin different. Love's been there. He's got, he's he got has. championships, too. He has. He's a, how, how, many, how many all-star appearances have he had? Numerous. I mean, Tristan Thompson hasn't. He hasn't been an all-star. So are you a believer in that if you sit a guy who's accustomed to starting that could mess with his psyche? Uh, sometimes it could be. It just this is not the time to do it. Yeah, you know you're in the playoffs. This is not the time where you sit your guy and you play those games. No, this is this is playoff time. It's time to go get it and and uh, you deal with that at the end of the season when it's all said and done. Contract time comes, trades this and that. Then you do that. You know you Kevin Love is a postseason player, just like what you're seeing with James Harden right now. James Harden. Has been it's been a knock on him for for many of uh, seasons or many years that he's not postseason player. So this is the first time really proving that I can play in the postseason. So that's what it's about, man. It's like you got your regular season players and you got your postseason players. And Kevin Love is a guy who's an all star who's capable who's supposed to be a postseason player. So you got to step up. How frustrating is it for Toronto from their perspective? I mean, it's it's it, it's it's sad. It's not frustrating. It's sad. It's, Tell us how you really feel. It's sad that you got a you're a ranked number one team against the number four team who's not the same as before. Even though they got LeBron James, and you're up by twenty, you still you come out and you lose at home. It's sad. It's sad that this team is taking you out four times in a row, and and you and you guys can't figure that out. I mean, that's just to me. After this situation, if they get taken out this time, there's need to be some changes on that team, including coaching staff as well. There needs to be changes all around. Somebody needs to get traded. Some Something different needs to happen. And new coach or something. But you cannot – and I'm talking about a Kyle Lowry or a DeMar DeRozan. Somebody's got to go. Really? You think yes. so? Because that one-two punch ain't doing it. They ain't making it happen. Well, know? this is true. They're, they're again, it's the same cast of characters as it's been for the past couple of years, especially with these Raptors Cavs matchups, as we all know. And yeah, to your point, it is not happening, Keith. And it is amazing to me how they're able to build these leads. And they're not the only team. Other teams have done it too against the Cavs. Uh, but then to just take your foot off the pedal. To me, it is amazing how you can't keep your foot in the pedal as you get deeper into the playoffs and as you've been the number one seed all year long in your conference. Something like that, you would think they would be able to do. Is it more so just a lack of 
you know, pedal to the metal full speed from Toronto, or is it more of just LeBron it's being will. LeBron? It's will. The will it's to win. will. And LeBron James is just on a whole other level than those guys. You know, it's like Kobe Bryant. It's like it's the will to win. It's knowing how to win. It's knowing what to do in certain situations. It's 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 demanding the ball. Like there was one. There's one thing about what Kobe Bryant would do. Everybody knew that he was getting the ball, including Kobe Bryant. And if you didn't give him the ball, then believe me, probably in that locker room, you're probably gonna you probably get cussed out, or it's gonna be a fight. You know, and it, that's and Michael Jordan was the same way, and it was just like, yo, put the ball in my hands is on me. And Kyle Lowry and Demar Derozan, if that's your team, and that ball needs to be in one of you guys' hand down the stretch, at, regardless. Or what? And everybody's got to know their role. You know, and and then they and for them, they got to demand that, but then they got to actually do it. They got to close the deal. You know, and that's what they're not doing. So. You know, like I said, it's more of a sad thing, and it, and it becoming. You know what? They're really going to become the laughing stock of, of, of the of people. Are not going to take them serious. It's or no organization going to take them. Serious. They at least got to take this team to game set, take Cleveland to game seven, or they really will be the laughing stock of the NBA because you can't lose four times to a team, and you're the number one seed. It's amazing how much pressure gets put on a home team when they lose game one to come back and win game two. It feels like it's a must-win in game two. I don't think you can go down 0-2 to LeBron and the Cavs no. when you have home court. I don't think you can do it. I really, I don't think they could recover. There, there's, if they don't win tomorrow night, it's over. It's over, and there's a good chance they could really get run out of the series. I, I totally agree with you. Absolutely. Absolutely, they can get run out of the series. I can definitely see that happening, so... Uh, and you know what? I told you from the big gate, I'm not a believer in Toronto. Yep, you've been consistent with that. I said I'm not a believer in them because it, it, it goes back to that. No disrespect to DeMar DeRozan and those guys, but to me they just, like that core, not going to say him as a player, person that doesn't have it, I'm not going to say that. But the core, their group of people, they just, like that core, just don't have it. They together. don't. They don't have that it factor to win big games. They don't know how to close it out. And Man, it's not the first time we've seen dude, that. They struggle. They struggle with Washington. I'm telling you, it's not the first time we've seen this either. With a team who gets a one seed uh, or slowly progresses their way up to that in a in a respective conference, division, whatever it may be, in any sports, we've seen this before. We can get lots of examples of teams throughout the years who have not been able to put it over the top. I mean, look at the Pittsburgh Steelers uh, with this current group of players that they've had now for the past three, four, or five years have not been able to get over the hump in the AFC. They just have not been able to do it for one reason or another despite a lot of talent there. And that's when you need to make changes. And it's a trip because franchises, managers, I think they're afraid to make those changes. It's mm-hmm. like you're afraid to step out and make those steps because you're like, damn, I'm making a big mistake. And, you know, I don't know. I think you you have to make the change if it happens. I know you're they're they're accustomed to seeing um, they're accustomed to seeing uh, those guys play together, but eventually you got to make a change if, it, if they can't get over that bridge, that hump. I mean, four times one team stops you. It's got to be a time where it's like, look, I understand the firepower they have in LeBron, but come on. They don't have – they have a young team this time. It's not the same a team. They have a young team. They cannot get beat like that. Game two coming up tomorrow, Cavs at the Raptors. Also game two tomorrow night, Sixers taking on the Celtics. Boston trying to go up two games to none. Philly trying to even that series up at one. As right now, uh, it's still a close game here as we come down the stretch. 98-94, Jazz with a four-point lead, six and a half to go. So a good good finish here coming up in game two. And honestly, if you saw game one, between these two teams, and also game one between Golden State and New Orleans, you thought to yourself that, whoa, this is going to be a little rough to see here uh, until we get to the conference finals. It looked like it was a foregone conclusion, Houston and Golden State, and it may very well wind up being that still. But you have to be encouraged by this tonight, the performance by Utah, uh, considering how things game things went in game one, 
uh, to make this a competitive series and uh, to now actually uh, push their lead up to six, 100 to 94 with six minutes to go. It's got to be encouraging and uh, not just for Utah, uh, but also teams who may come out of the East as well. Uh, because let's face it, if it's not LeBron and the Cavs, which I think they still will come out of the East, maybe it's uh, the Boston Celtics or maybe it's the Sixers. Uh, teams that have to be able to see that. I, it's important that Houston and, our goal, or, and or Golden State does not cruise to the NBA Finals like we had last year. Yeah, that, That's an important thing. It's important for the viewers, too, and the fans, obviously, uh, as far as uh, viewership goes, is to make sure that this is not going to be uh, a cakewalk again. So it's just good to see. It's an encouraging performance tonight here uh, by the Jazz. Speaking of Utah, Donovan Mitchell, we know he's had a great year. And we know also how dialed in he is as far as taking the advice of former players, Keith, former all-time great players in the NBA. And he's really locked in here to Kobe's new show, Detail, on ESPN. Of course. Very locked into it. Um, People say that Donovan Mitchell studies the game and almost prepares like a Kobe Bryant, which is maybe the best kind of high praise you could possibly receive, albeit in your rookie season. So it's been fascinating to get, you know, just to kind of get a a look inside of Donovan Mitchell. Everyone, the public is just getting to know him, obviously, here. He maybe could win the Rookie of the Year. He probably should at this point. And uh, it's just shaping up, uh, obviously, to to be a heck of a career for him. Obviously, year one, we want to pump the brakes a little bit. We don't want to go over the top here. But uh, you have to be encouraged what you've seen from him. Well, definitely, you got to be encouraged what you see. I mean, the kid's been playing ex- ex- phenomenal. Um, to me, he is a rookie of the year. Um, and, yeah, I mean, look, it, why not study from the best? I mean, you got LeBron James, Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan. You know, those are the guys you want to study because those guys would really change the evolution of the game. And so, you know, I just think that – He's in emerging into a superstar. What people are starting seeing right now is an emergence of a superstar right now. Really, he's going to be a guy who's going to be playing in Utah for a very long time. Um, and uh, he's, I mean, the things he's doing, even the game they got blown out against, I mean, he still is putting up some big numbers. And he's not afraid. He's fearless. He does. He goes at you. Like I said, he respects you know, the Wessel Rest Brooks and the top guys. He wants to be at that level. And to be honest with you, he's there. He's playing at that level. Um, and, I mean, me, well, I, I'm a, I'm honestly a fan watching him play. I'm a fan of his right now. You know, he's really turned me into a fan. Um, you know, I was high on Dennis, Mitchell Jr., Dennis Smith Jr. when they, when they started, when they first came in uh, this season. And he's done a great job over there at Dallas. But this Donovan Mitchell, man, he's like the things he can do, the way he can get into the lane and, and score, it's uh, uh, it's been it's been a sight to see. It's amazing what a, the difference a year makes in Utah. Obviously, last year in the offseason, the departure of one Gordon Haywood to the Boston Celtics it looked like the future was bleak, to say the least, in Utah. But it's just amazing, obviously, them drafting Mitchell, adding Ricky Rubio via trade from Minnesota, and how they really have been able to create an atmosphere here in a short amount of time with the Jazz. A young team, obviously, a very young nucleus, to be able to compete in the Western Conference and uh, to be here in the conference semis against the top seeded Houston Rockets. The, the whole direction of the Utah Jazz has just completely changed around uh, like I said, it's amazing the difference a year makes for them. So they're in a good spot right now. Donovan Mitchell, you have to love, obviously, like you said, Keith, what you're hearing from him and his thoughts on Kobe's new detail show. I love how we see Kobe still in the media. I always thought when Kobe was playing that eventually we would see him as a broadcaster. Yeah. I thought we would always see that. I wanted to see him as a color guy. I thought he would provide some great insights, and who knows, he maybe, Stu, might do that at some point in the future, uh, but it's good to see him at least get started here with the show, which I haven't been able to watch yet, uh, but I hear it's great. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I haven't watched it either, but what I saw from um, Story Times and yeah. that he does, I mean, he does a great job with those things, and 
He's producing. One thing about it, he's an Emmy Award. Now he's an Emmy Award winner. But he's a great producer. And he, what he's been doing and producing these this stuff, it's been great. And I, I didn't know that they, he would. What's the interesting thing was surprising? He partnered up with ESPN. You know, he didn't want to become a broadcaster. I didn't think he was going to do that. I think at one point he was starting to go into, like, stocks and he wanted to do something completely different. But now he's going back to sports way, but he's doing, showing his angle of things and how he's doing it and having his own show with ESPN. I think that's a great addition for ESPN to have. I mean, anybody, the fact that remains is Kobe Bryant. You're going to listen to him. You're going to watch it, and everyone's going to watch that. You know, that's going to go on for a long time as long as he wants to go. So, um, you know, it's, it's great to see that Kobe's doing um, his his thing in, in the producing world of sports and entertainment. And, um, you know, I think it's, it's yet to, you know, is is more to come with him. You know, you're going to start seeing just a whole different side of Kobe that people have never seen before. I mean, he's this is something he's obviously been into for the whole, his whole, like, even during his career playing ball. You know? It seems that way. We've yeah. learned more of that now after he has retired. Uh, it's it's interesting. I wouldn't have thought that he would uh, be such a good producer, like you said, yeah. and uh, have the ability to uh, uh, be uh, a writer. And um, uh, just, I think he's dabbled in some writing as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So story story time. story tell. Yeah. So I, it, it it's good to see, obviously, and. Um, it, not surprising as far as uh, the talent ability of him and what he's able to do post career. I mean, you're going to listen to what he says, um, you know, because he's one of the greatest to play. So even these guys that are, even these guys that are playing in the game now, they're probably recording those things and listening to what he says because it's, they're going to. And those guys are taking it. They're taking it, taking that all in and listening to him. You know, he's a. Kobe Bryant is a guy that people are like, oh, they wanted to see him coach at one point, but then it was like he couldn't because his temperament, the way he is. Oh, he's like a Michael a Jordan. And I Same so thing. get that. And I think this is just the perfect balance is really I'm going to study you and show you what you're doing just on here, and you really can take it what it is or you don't have to. And this is what, you know, like most of his segments are about one of the players what they did in the game and then they're studying how they do certain things and then they're like what he can do different and they're those guys are really taking that advice and they're utilizing it yeah the we're seeing it with mitchell right now yeah. right it's a beautiful thing to see utah by nine at the moment over houston coming up on four and a half to play pedal to the it's metal here right yet. keith not, yeah not over it's they're playing a great game utah you, you know, I'm watching this game, and, you, you know, what you're seeing is, look, they're just on right now. They're, you're starting to see a Utah team. Let me tell you what's dangerous about Utah. Once they figure it out, then you're in trouble, and that's what they did with OKC. If you notice, it took them two games, about two games to really figure them out. And once they start to figure you out, they're in, they're in it. And the thing about Houston is Houston can go cold, and when they go cold, they go cold. And then when they get hot, they get hot. Well, that's when they get in trouble, when yeah. they go cold, when they rely too much on the Exactly, threat. exactly. And the quick shots. And that's what I'm saying about this game, the game that they play, that that's what's going to get them in trouble if they, if they face a Golden State. It's because you can't go cold and stay cold and then go hot when you go hot because Golden State stays hot. And one thing about Golden State, they don't live They don't live by the three. They they move that ball and they got to get – they get a lot of proportion of inside shots the same as outside shots. It's different. Golden uh, Houston likes to move the ball perimeter. They'll have the ball right underneath the basket and, and kick it out for a three. You know, they're playing more yeah, like like Mike D'Antoni likes to play, European ball. And so, you know, I don't think that's going to work. And you can't give up 108 points to a Golden State team to, in order to be successful. Matter of fact, you can't give 108 points to Utah and think you're going to be Uh, successful. I know. Let's just uh, look here at the present at the moment. Yeah, you know, and and I think Utah's a tough place to play at. So, um, you know, I don't know. I would love to see hopefully Ricky Rubio comes back because I would like to see them play. That'd be great. But I don't know if that's going to happen. If they said they go – I think if it's to go past game four or five or something like that, then he may come back. But You'd like to see him at full strength. I would like to see him. I would like to see him. But – it's going to be interesting, man. It, it, it's, you see, you know, you got they got a box out right there. That was a wide open. 
that's a second chance. You can't give this team second chance shots. You got to box out uh, on those things. Those are little things that you got to do with Houston in order to beat Houston. The boxing out, you know. Look, Chris Paul's off. You can't give Capella two or three you know, chances at this basket. You know, so those are the two guys you got to stop. If Chris Paul and James Harden are both cold, you're in trouble. They're it's behind trouble. the mic. We're live from Grunion Sports Bar and Grill here in Manhattan Beach on this Wednesday night. Coming back for more after this. Every 17 minutes, make a wish makes the impossible possible. They tame dragons. They bring Saturn to Earth. They help superheroes save entire cities. They even make unicorns fly. All to give children the strength they need to fight their critical illnesses. Every wish takes muscle. Help us make sure every wish comes true. Join us at wish.org. Our military service members volunteer to protect us in the most dangerous places around the world. They step up. And when they are severely ill or injured, returning to their families is only the beginning of their long road home. Beyond all the hospitals and doctors and surgeries they need just to survive, they also deserve whatever they need to truly live. All the in-home care and day-to-day help they need to live independently, on their own terms. Wounded Warrior Project long-term support programs were established to provide these brave men and women whatever they need to continue their fight for independence at no cost for life. So many of them need us, and it's time for a grateful nation to step up. Find out how you can do your part at findwwp.org. We all come together and stand together to serve our veterans. We invest in the latest technology. We take the time to train the next generation of doctors and nurses. We work together to make sure we heal their bodies and their minds. This is our mission. More than 300,000 of us working as one, together with families and loved ones. No matter where they live in this country, we'll be there. We stand strong, united. Stand with us in caring for our veterans. Dave. What are you doing? Just sending a gift to Dave2037. Who? Me in the future. I save a little money from every paycheck as a gift to Dave2037, so he can spend it on things like anti-gravity boots or a hologram Doberman. Something cool like that. I think Dave2037 deserves it. He worked hard. What are you getting Steve2037? I guess I was thinking Steve2037 would just fend for himself. Well, all right. But don't expect to be borrowing my anti-gravity boots. You want to have money in your future? You got to start saving now. Putting some money from every paycheck into a savings account or contributing to your 401k can make a big difference later. Put away a few bucks, feel like a million bucks. For free ideas and easy ways to save, go to feedthepig.org. That's feedthepig.org. Hey, let's just hope Steve2037 doesn't get his hands on a cold time machine because he is going to come back here and knock some sense into you. This message brought to you by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants and the Ad Council. Hi, I'm Danica Patrick and proud aunt. Watching my nieces grow, play, and learn is amazing, but not every child gets to be carefree. One in six kids in the U.S. are hungry. One in six. That little girl sitting alone at the playground, she can't play like the other kids. She doesn't have the energy because she's hungry. School lunch will be her only meal today. It breaks my heart that this is the reality in our country, but it's something that Feeding America is working to change. Each year, the Feeding America network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste. This food is then provided to families and children in need. Being a kid should be about using your imagination, learning, and having fun. These children shouldn't have to miss out on simply being a kid because they're hungry. To find out how you can help end childhood hunger in your community, visit feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Everybody buckle up. Buckle up. Let's go. Buckle up. Can we go to the store? Buckle up. Everybody buckle up. 
A lot goes on in the car, but you're in control. So only move when you hear the click that says they're buckled in. Never give up until they buckle up. Learn more at safercar.gov slash kidsbuckleup. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. This is Behind the Mic with Brad Dalius. Dave, what are you doing? Just sending a gift to Dave2037. Who? Me in the future. I save a little money from every paycheck as a gift to Dave2037, so he can spend it on things like anti-gravity boots or a hologram Doberman. Something cool like that. I think Dave2037 deserves it. He worked hard. What are you getting Steve2037? I guess I was thinking Steve2037 would just fend for himself. Well, all right. But don't expect to be borrowing my anti-gravity boots. You want to have money in your future? You got to start saving now. Putting some money from every paycheck into a savings account or contributing to your 401k can make a big difference later. Put away a few bucks, feel like a million bucks. For free ideas and easy ways to save, go to feedthepig.org. That's feedthepig.org. Hey, let's just hope Steve2037 doesn't get his hands on a cold time machine because he is going to come back here and knock some sense into you. This message brought to you by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants and the Ad Council. I'm more resourceful than I thought. My suit can still make an impression. My video games are still game changers. And my lamp can bring others a bright future. Because when I donate my stuff to Goodwill, it helps fund job placement and training for people right in my community. Now my stuff gets a second chance. And will give someone in my community a second chance too. Goodwill. Donate stuff. Create jobs. Find your nearest donation center at Goodwill.org. That's Goodwill.org. This message brought to you by Goodwill and the Ad Council. Hi, I'm Danica Patrick and proud aunt. Watching my nieces grow, play, and learn is amazing. But not every child gets to be carefree. One in six kids in the U.S. are hungry. One in six. That little girl sitting alone at the playground, she can't play like the other kids. She doesn't have the energy because she's hungry. School lunch will be her only meal today. It breaks my heart that this is the reality in our country, but it's something that Feeding America is working to change. Each year, the Feeding America network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste. This food is then provided to families and children in need. Being a kid should be about using your imagination, learning, and having fun. These children shouldn't have to miss out on simply being a kid because they're hungry. To find out how you can help end childhood hunger in your community, visit feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Everybody buckle up. Mom, 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 mom. Mom. Buckle up. Let's go. Buckle up. Can we go to the store? Mom, buckle can we up. Get some ice cream? Mom. Everybody, everybody, buckle up. A lot goes on in the car, but you're in control. So only move when you hear the click that says they're buckled in. Never give up until they buckle up. Learn more at safercar.gov slash kidsbuckleup. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Dave, what are you doing? Just sending a gift to Dave2037. Who? Me in the future. I save a little money from every paycheck as a gift to Dave2037, so he can spend it on things like anti-gravity boots or a hologram Doberman. Something cool like that. I think Dave2037 deserves it. He worked hard. What are you getting Steve2037? I guess I was thinking Steve2037 would just fend for himself. Well, all right. But don't expect to be borrowing my anti-gravity boots. You want to have money in your future? You got to start saving now. Putting some money from every paycheck into a savings account or contributing to your 401k can make a big difference later. Put away a few bucks, feel like a million bucks. For free ideas and easy ways to save, go to feedthepig.org. That's feedthepig.org. Hey, let's just hope Steve2037 doesn't get his hands on a cold time machine because he is going to come back here and knock some sense into you. This message brought to you by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants and the Ad Council. Our military service members volunteer to protect us in the most dangerous places around the world. They step up. And when they are severely ill or injured, returning to their families is only the beginning of their long road home. Beyond all the hospitals and doctors and surgeries they need just to survive, they also deserve whatever they need to truly live. All the in-home care and day-to-day help they need to live independently, on their own terms. 
Wounded Warrior Project long-term support programs were established to provide these brave men and women whatever they need to continue their fight for independence at no cost for life. So many of them need us, and it's time for a grateful nation to step up. Find out how you can do your part at findwwp.org. Welcome back. Behind the mic, we are live here from Grunions on this Wednesday night. Brad and Keith hanging out. 114-108 Utah with the lead at the moment. 50 seconds to go trying to hold on here in game two and trying to tie up this best of seven at one game apiece. The Jazz have played solid all night long. And we'll see if they can hold on here as they go down the stretch. Meanwhile, we have Stanley Cup playoff action going on tonight, Keith. Those Vegas Golden Knights. Oh, yeah. They're down one nothing at the moment to the Sharks, but we know they've got some magic up their sleeves that they've had all year and all postseason long so far. So uh, I, I, we could probably bet that this one will maybe go to overtime, maybe double overtime knowing this night squad yeah. and what they've been able to do. Uh, but they're trying to go up three games to one and take a commanding lead over San Jose tonight. So we'll keep you posted on that one. Another news today as far as the NBA is concerned – Billy Donovan, he's going to return to Golden State, or going to return to OKC, rather. Uh, they decided to bring him back um, for another season. And the biggest thing with the Thunder right now, and the biggest thing the front office is really trying to convey, Keith, is continuity. Yeah, They want to keep the same guy with Donovan, bring him back as head coach. We don't know what's going to happen with Paul George. We think we probably know what's going to happen with Carmelo Anthony. I can't imagine he's going to leave money on the table. He's going to pick up that option and yeah. come back once again to the Thunder for a second season. Uh, but obviously a lot of unknowns with the Thunder. We talked about this a little bit the other night. But, again, they've proven now, especially with Westbrook, that he hasn't been able to win with a combination of a lot of different players. Yeah. So they have some soul-searching to do, as other teams do this off season, But... The biggest thing is, obviously, if Paul George decides to leave. And that really shakes things up for them. And at this point, again, as I said before, when the playoffs were just beginning, if OKC got bounced early, I thought that was a good thing for the Lakers and Lakers fans who want to see George come here to L.A. this summer. I still believe that is uh, going to be a good thing. I think OKC is going to have a hard time pitching him to come back to a scenario in which they haven't been able to win, as I said, with the main guy there. I don't know about that. I I, I heard it sounded like to me when Paul George was in his post uh, post uh, when he's in his after the game, yeah, uh, his post game conference. He said, "I would like." He said in quote, "He said I would, you know, I would like to return as a Thunder, but we'll see what how the table, how the things uh, fall in play." You know, he did say that in his post conference. And and that says a lot to the OKC Thunder that you know there is still a chance that you can have him there, and you know so for me, I think he's going to exhaust all his options, but really I think Westbrook and those guys Carmelo are going to try to are going to have a big part of persuading him to come back. If they say, look, we got some unfinished business we do, we're going to get better next year, you know, come on, let's give this another shot. I can see him doing that. I really can. Look, he's in the Western Conference, so he, I know everybody's like, oh, he wants him to come to L.A. You know what? I honestly think we have a better shot. The Lakers have a better shot at getting Kawhi Leonard and Giannis Oladipo. Via trade. Via, via trade. I really do think that's their best bet. Who would you be willing to part ways with? <laughs> I'll part ways with Alonzo Ball, too, if he's willing <laughs> to say that. I'll, about, I'll part ways with a lot of those guys that are up in there. There's a lot of guys, except for Kyle Kuzma. Uh, I like Kyle Kuzma. I like uh, Brandon Ingram. Brandon B B I. I love Brandon Ingram. I like uh, the the guard from uh, Villanova. What's his name? I forgot his name because he named Hart. I like Hart. Josh Hart. Josh Hart. And after that, everybody else can go. I mean, to be honest, it was quite frank with you. 
that, those are the only guys I'll keep. You know, I would get rid of like, To me, I don't think Lonzo's the great. I, I thought he was. So are great. you you're more willing to roll with Isaiah Thomas? I would roll with IT. Okay. I How would, much would you be willing to pay him? I wouldn't pay him. I wouldn't pay him what he's asking for. But uh, we can revisit that conversation in a year or so. Um, but he was – so when he came back, man, he, heard or not, he was instant 20-something points a game. You're right. He was producing like the, like. We talked right about away. it here on the show. He was yeah, very impressive. And, and that's what you need, man. You need that. That's what you need. I don't care about his height. Like, no. If the dude can produce, he can produce. There was a guy called Spud Webb that used to do it back in the day. Come on, Muggsy Bogues. There's Will, uh, Avery Johnson. Have we forgot? A trip down memory lane. Have we forgot guys. about these guys? You know, have we forgot about those guys? You know, um, short guys can get it done too. You know, so um, and let's let's not forget that just a year before that he was in MVP conversations. Have we forgot about that? You know, so you know when I look when I go back to it, man. Lakers need to go ahead and sign that guy, um, and then, um, but yeah, everybody else can go. I, I, I'll take, I'll take the defense of the arguably the best two way player in the game, Kawhi Leonard, and Kobe Bryant's been high on this guy, Giannis, and yes, I would trade up and give him. I would sign Julius and trade him. I would. Yeah, I know you would. You're, yeah. Julius Randle can't get out of L.A. quick enough for Keith Jackson at this point. It's true. 213-261-7491. 213-261-7491. I still think that Paul George is more likely to come here than a Kawhi Leonard this offseason. Because, again, you have to get Leonard if you're going to get him via trade. I think it's just going to be a little difficult to sell. Because, again, if I'm San Antonio, why would I want... Lonzo Ball. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, if I'm looking at it from the Spurs' perspective and their front office, why am I going to trade Kawhi Leonard, even though we know there's a lot of inner turmoil there with that situation? I would probably, if I'm them, I would probably look elsewhere versus trying to get back Lonzo Ball in exchange for Kawhi Leonard. And again, I mean, it's, just, it, it's the thing, the problem with the Lakers roster is that it's just so raw. And this is one of the biggest things that. You can make the case that it's going to be tough to lure big free agents here because they're so raw and they're so unproven at this point in time. Even though we can see that there's a lot of potential, Brendan Ingram is a raw player, and we know where Lonzo Ball stands. But it's interesting, though, about Isaiah Thomas and and that you think that way. Because I agree. I agree. Very encouraged by what we saw from him when he came over via trade from Cleveland and how he. this means a lot to him, this opportunity. That someone actually wanted him, regardless of who it was, and that he is willing to put in the work to become the best player possible, despite the size, which, again, I can get over. I mean, give me someone who's like two feet tall, but has a heart of a lion, who's willing to put in all the work and effort over someone, you know, who's seven foot tall and just really is not willing to, yeah, work on a regular basis and put in the amount of time that's required to be your best. So I'm perfectly fine with rolling with Isaiah Thomas. I agree with you on that front. It's going to be interesting, uh, and... Again, I, I don't, like, as I said before a couple weeks back, I don't think Lakers fans should approach this summer that it's a failure if they don't get some of these top guys. Yeah. I don't think we if they approach it that way, they're going to be sorely disappointed, I think. It can't be an all-or-nothing thing. I think fans have to see the progress. Although it's slow, they did progress this year from last year, and we know they're going to be aggressive. Yeah. We know Magic and Palinka are going to be very, very aggressive this summer. If you could have Kawhi Leonard or Giannis, what would be your preference? That's a tough one. Uh, Oh, that's tough. Man, that's tough. Can I have both? I I, I think I would have to go with, uh, oh, that's tough. That really is tough. The injury factor with Kawhi has got to be a little concerning. A little concerning. It, we know Giannis is, is healthy. Giannis is healthy. He's long. He can block shots. Uh, it'll probably have to be Giannis. Yeah. He can put more fans in the stands. Oh, that's an easy one. So that's an easy one. And Kawhi you know, Leonard is a little more and you think laid about, back. 
of a guy, you yeah. could say. And you need somebody who's be able to defend those long guys who's going to be able to defend the uh, Kevin Durant's. You do. Yeah, when you think of it that way for matchups in the West. The Anthony Davis's, you know, weak side blocks from a Steven Adams or something like that. So that's what you would have to do. So I would have to go with Giannis. As far as just being like an L.A. guy, I feel like Giannis would really fit in well out here. He's done oh, he's commercials. Hilarious. Yeah, he's done commercials for ESPN and Sports Center. I can absolutely see him filling into and uh, this type of role out here if he were to be on the Lakers and doing other things as well on the side. I can absolutely see it. I don't. I, to me, Kawhi Leonard is such a mystery. Not yeah. saying I wouldn't want him with the Lakers, but he's a he's very much you know, a mystery, and I feel it's lay, more of a risk. He's a laid back guy. They said he that is. they said that he still was like when he first got when he still was. When he even signed his extension, his contract, he was still driving his like '98 Ford Explorer that he got in college. Like that was his car. He, you know, he's not like the flashy guy. He's not. He's like a laid back. He's just a hooper. Like I just want to hoop, and that's it. And that's the type of person he is. But you know, it kind of, it kind of did rub me in the wrong way what he did to his teammates this past season. Because I still felt like, you know, you're trying to get better. You could have been at least on the bench. And that has to raise eyebrows, and that will raise my eyebrow. It's like, yo, what was really going on? Why were you there? You know, it has. I, I'll have to get an explanation before I sign up, for sure. By the way, it's all over in Houston. The Jazz topped the Rockets 116-108. It is a tied series now that pressure, at one game apiece. And that pressure now goes back to Houston because – it's going to be very hard. I think this is the thing that's so dangerous about uh, Utah. Utah doesn't play just one way. You know, they can play multiple ways. And that the way that Dan Tony plays with the Houston Rockets, they play one way and that's it. Throw up quick shots. And I just think that it's going to be very tough to do down in Utah. If Utah goes out there and let me tell you, they if they go home and really figure it out how to beat this team, and if you see a lead like this again, you're going to see Houston's going to be in trouble. You know, that's what I'll say. But on the flip side, if 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 Houston comes back and they put it together and they come back and they're on fire and they take care of business out there, which they're capable of doing, and they've beat uh, – they've already beat in the regular season and beat Utah three times. Um, and and those are big, Utah, right? Yes. Like, when we're analyzing these series and these games – Going back to the regular season and those matchups can really be a good predictor yeah. of what's to come. And they're gonna say, "Well, Jay Crowder." I don't think it's overrated. There. I don't either. They're gonna say, "Well, Jay Crowder run and this and that." I don't think that. what I'm just saying is that if they can go out there and and steal a game or so like that, all all really Houston needs to do is steal a game. You know, if they steal a game, they're gonna be all right because they're gonna play. The way that format is is what two is two two one one I believe. Yeah, two two one 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 one. Yeah, yeah, that's how it is now from the first round all the way through the finals. Yeah, two two one one one. So you you would need. I honestly think Utah would need to run the and beat the win these two games in order to put themselves in a good position, in a very good position. They got to win. They have to win at home. They have to. Have to defend the home court. They have to. They got to defend their home court because I think that it's going to come back to Houston. I think it will go back to Houston, and Houston will win that one. And then they got to go back home, and they can hopefully steal that one. But you know, win that. You know, but you don't want to go no Game Seven, no Houston Rockets because you're not. I don't think they're winning that. <laughs> the only team who's equipped to winning that type of Game Seven matchup in the Houston is absolutely the the Warriors. No question. What's the but hardest? You've seen, you seen the emergence of a Donovan Mitchell again. Like you are this Utah team. You know what's interesting? You know I, I watch Utah a couple of games, but not too much. But you're really seeing that this Utah team is really a different. It's weird watching them because I'm so used to watch, used to watching Utah when they had Stockton and Malone and the way they played the pick and roll. And you don't see that with these teams now. You see more of a flashy up and down pop the three and. They're more of a flashier team this year. They got big. They got big players and stuff, and they got players. Most of their forwards and everybody can shoot the three, and all four of the guys on the floor can shoot the three except Rudy Gobert, you know. And then so and they can shoot on a consistent basis. So it's just a different t- style of team, you know. And what the Exum pickup was great because look it's what he did. Helped them a lot. 
it's helped him. This uh, you know, with Ricky Rubio out, you've seen you've seen him come out in his speed, and it, it's just hard to match that. So, you know, they got a deep team, man. They they do got a deep team, and uh, it's going to be interesting to see what that happens. I can't. I actually can't wait to the next game in Utah. Now more than ever, I think depth is the utmost importance in yes. the NBA than it's ever been. Maybe in the history of the league, Keith. You look at Golden State. No Curry, no problem. They can stoop blow you out. Utah, no Ricky Rubio, no problem. We've got depth. We can make up for that. If you don't have depth behind one of your top guys in your starting lineups, you're screwed. Because other teams can match you and better you with that at this point in time. We're seeing it in these playoffs. If you can't match up with that on that level, you're not going to be able to advance. There's just too many good players. And to your point of how so many guys can shoot the three now from beyond the arc, whereas back in the the day that just wasn't the case. That's not really how they taught it. As you mentioned, pick and roll a lot with teams like Utah and the Jazz like they used to do with Stockton and Malone. The triangle offense with Phil Jackson and the Lakers, you just don't see it as much anymore because uh, there is such a tremendous amount of depth in how so many guys uh, can not only play their role great, but they can play their role in the sense of as if they were a starter, sort of say. So to me, that is the difference completely from some of these upper echelon teams in the NBA and teams who are just nowhere near this level. Yeah. And, and what are you seeing is, like, like, again, like the triangle offense, to me, you mentioned the triangle offense. The triangle offense would actually go great with some of these teams that are playing out here. Guys who have, like, the best ball handling. I go back to the Lakers, even the Lakers team this year with them. And You were a proponent of they should be running it. They should be. They, they should have been because they don't have the greatest ball handlers, and that's what the, the, the triangle offense is based off of. Like I said, you had Ron Harper. Was Ron Harper that type of player where he was like in between the legs, cross you up, get to the hole? No. Was Derek Fisher that type of player, cross you up, get you the hole? No. We can go further than that. Was B.J. Armstrong those type of player, cross you up? Get, no, he wasn't. They had it, the type of players they had were like slashing to the basket, cuts, hitting jump shots, hitting wide open threes. You know, those are the type of players, and that's what that's predicated and made on. And, and, and it's all reads. One, and think about the triangle, you cannot stop it. You can't because it's all reads. It's basically all body movement. When one person goes, and you know you got to go that way. And it's constant movement. So I think it will, they will flourish in that. And I think some of these teams would. I'm a huge fan of the triangle offense. I learned it. But the thing is, you got to have the patience to learn it. And that's the thing these days. Right now in the basketball world, a lot of these guys don't have the patience. They rather do this pick and pop, pick and it, like the big man's taking out the game. Now, I don't like just, it. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't get that. This is shit. the basketball purist in me longs yeah. for the days of when we have more of the big man down low, feed it into Banging. him, slam it home. I wish we would see more of that. Yeah. Right. I mean, it would. That would be. It's a little bit too predictable now, in a sense. You see, the only team I can see really doing that, I mean, that really, I'll have to say, is um, the San Antonio Spurs. Yeah. You know, they fed it into uh, Jamarcus Aldridge. Aldridge stepped out a little bit, but they tend to stick to what they had, what they've always been doing. Um, you've seen a little bit glimpse of it uh, with uh, with Utah now, but you rarely see them pound it into the post, kick it out for a three. You you rarely see that with big guys. You have these big guys on the wing, and I'm gonna tell you that's the problem with this 76ers team. If 76ers, if they do what they did before against the Celtics this upcoming game tomorrow, they're gonna lose. You cannot have Joel and B pick and pop. He has to be pick and get to the basket roll, back towards the basket. That's where he's best at. He's best. It's not his face-up game. It's his back towards the basket and the way he can turn and face up and hit those 5'10 footers. But if it's pick and pop, they're going to lose again. I guarantee you. I really believe Boston will go up two games to none tomorrow. I believe it. I don't think people are taking them seriously enough. I hope the Sixers team is. I think the coaching staff is, Brett Brown and company. But like we talked about last night with the inexperience factor with the Sixers and being there for the first time, you don't know what it's going to be like until you go up against a team and 
despite all the injuries with the Celtics, they play the best team ball of any of the teams left. They do more with less than any of these teams remaining. Brad Stevens has been able to get the most. You talk about maximizing your players and their abilities, you're seeing it right now with Boston. Yeah. Meanwhile, today the Phoenix Suns make history, Keith, as they hire Igor Kosakovs. Did I pronounce that correct? Yep, you pronounced it right. That's close. <laughs> close enough? <laughs> close enough. He's going to become the head coach for Phoenix, and the history part is he's the first European-born head coach in the NBA. Oh, wow. Right. Currently on the uh, Utah Jazz's uh, coaching staff. So he'll move over once Utah, uh, once their playoff run is done, he'll become the Phoenix Suns head coach. Obviously, Phoenix has been terrible now for quite some time, and they had the best chances of getting the number one pick in this year's draft in June if the ping pongs bounce their way. Who would the Suns, who should they take number one overall? Oh. If they get that pick? There's no question. Melvin. Uh. Oh my gosh! What did I, I'm, I'm Marvin, I'm Marvin, Marvin Bagley, the third. That's who you take. There's no question about it. Marvin Bagley the third is the first round pick of the draft. I can't believe I missed. I was thinking of some somebody else at the at one in time. So I, I apologize for you guys out there. But hey, we Marvin, got we got a lot of names that come yeah, to mind. Marvin Bagley Jr. third, Jr. the third is the first round pick, hands down. If you don't pick him, you're a fool. Because I what he does is, is, is phenomenal. Is phenomenal. Look, let me just give you a little backstory about Marvin Bagley the third. This guy played. This is how I knew he was for real. He played in. Um, he played in the Drew League out here. It's called the Drew League Basketball Drew League, which is known out here in Los Angeles, California, for you folks that don't know about this. Is in L. A. Watts at. It's in it's in located in Los Angeles in Watts in the city of Watts, at uh, Drew um, at uh, Charles R. Drew uh, School, um, and Nike puts it on. They Chris Paul, James Harden played it in it this summer to get some chemistry going. James Harden plays in it every year. Baron Davis, a lot of the NBA stars. Kobe Bryant's played in it. LeBron James, I can go all down the list. So, in other words, players. if you're playing in this, yeah. your, your future looks your, bright. Yeah, your future looks bright. And Ron, Ron Artest has a well, Metal World piece, a.k.a. Ron Ron, has a team in there. And everybody has a team uh, a team in there. And James Harden, he'll go back and he'll play in it next year, this summer. Um, but everybody goes down and it's free. So, go down there and watch them. And you can watch all these top players overseas professional athletes to NBA guys to guys that have been legends in high schools that have been playing and Marvin Bagley the third played in it as a junior and I watched this with my own eyes he literally took apart players like literally I'm talking pros DeMar DeRozan not to knock you DeMar DeRozan but DeMar, Marvin Bagley has can play he can play with the best of them and he puts up numbers, and he don't. It's no drop off. I put like this: there's no drop off when he's playing out there with those guys. He is a pro, and um, I remember he didn't forgo his senior. He didn't he, after his senior. He didn't forgo his senior year in high school, and he went to Duke this this upcoming past year. And they were, I believe, Duke was ranked number. I believe I think at the time before they even said it, it was like fourteen. I think they were ranked like number fourteen. And so when they said Marvin Bagley was going through their school, they instantly jumped to number one. That's how good a player this guy is. This guy can play with his back towards the basket. He can shoot the three. He can drive, take you off the dribble. He he has a great finger roll. He reminds he actually reminds me of like and I'm gonna take you back really far. For some people, they'll probably remember, but he reminds me of like just me and me studying game. I've never seen him playing, but like Earl yeah. the Pearl. Oh wow, George Gervin. Like he's that type of player where his finger rolls and he takes it back. And I, these guys, I, I I never saw them play, but I've seen tape and video because I studied the game. And he plays like them, you know. So. Um, he's going to be a franchise player. He's going to be a great player. I can't wait to see him this summer with the, whoever team he's going to play for. 
But uh, he's he's a phenomenal player. You got to pick him. Him with Devin Booker. I don't know what type of offense they're going to run, but they let me tell you, team. they're going to have a young team. They're going to have Josh Jackson, Devin Booker, Marvin Bagley. III. These are guys that are going to be running the league in a, long, in a while. And, I mean, for a long time. They're going to be a great, solid team. And you got I, I just think, like, look, with him, you got to utilize him. If you play that Euro path, go up the ball, up, up the floor, shoot the ball three with Dan Tony's playing, I ain't going to work with Marvin Bagley Jr. And that's the thing. Like, you've got to utilize him the way he's capable of using. You've got to, you know, use, use him in your system. And, and that's what that's what scouting is for during the season is you look at, like, Coach K, like how his system ran. He'd pound the ball inside sometimes and kick it out. You know, you need that type of system with him, you know. And uh, hopefully they pick him up. I'll be excited to see. If he, if he plays with Devin Booker, I think it's going to be a great – great duo right there yeah they're such a young team like i said if they get the right guy you would think they're just going to continue to progress forward and it's obviously looking like they probably will run more of that euro ball with the new head coach coming in here but i think it's a good thing though for a young team to have a coach like this and obviously he's coming over from utah eventually like i said when their season's done the run they've been on now he's learned obviously a lot of different things and He comes in, Phoenix obviously, they have a history of being a run-and-gun type team. Wayne D'Antoni used to be there with Steve Nash. I think if they go, to your point, Keith, let's say they do draft Bagley, if they're able to to cater to his needs and play his style of ball to utilize him the best, that would be a great move for the franchise, I think, to go in that type of direction. Uh They should really, they should not go back as far as what they used to do. I don't think because how many championships do they win under Dan Tony? None. <laughs> right. So <laughs> I, I think it would only help to, to benefit them it, to your point if they play more towards uh, and uh, cater to the needs of a player like Bagley and his style. Like you said, Duke was willing to change. Yeah. Coach K was willing to change the things he did to be able to play to his different guys' strengths. I think that's what it's all about. I, that's those are the coaches today that are going to have the most success in the NBA. And you're seeing it now with Stevens in Boston. You're seeing it with Brett Brown in Philadelphia and other young coaches across the NBA. That's really what you have to do. Trying to put a, a, a round peg into a square hole just doesn't work. Yeah. I mean, I agree. Uh, and, I mean, you have to make some changes. But the thing is, you know, <laughs> There's just so many other coaches out there, I think, that could have got that job, that I would have liked to see got that job. Um, such as? Such as uh, Tisdale. Okay. I like his – I like him. Um, you know, I, I thought he was a great addition to Memphis, and I think he would have been great for Phoenix. Um, you know, just the style of play where they play. Uh, and, again, it's just showing you how the game is, ch- like, is changing. Like, the, the, a lot of these European guys are coming in and, and – they're getting the jobs, and there's nothing wrong with that, but they're trying to evolutionize the game into that. And it's like, I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see. You, you know, you just have to see how everything goes. You know, you got to uh, – it's really hard to tell right now what type of style they're going to play. Uh, they may play – they may play a, a, a set, a, you know, set offense, you know, but um, we'll, uh, it's just going to be hard to tell. But I'm interested to see what happens. I want to go through a couple different guys who haven't been hired yet. There's been speculation. Do you think they'll be hired? Okay. Jeff Van Gundy. Do you think you'd be hired anywhere? Should he be hired? He's a good coach. He should be hired somewhere. But uh, do I think he's going to be hired? He's probably lower on my list. Guys, I don't think so. Mark Jackson. I think he should definitely be hired. I think he should go to New York Knicks. We talked about that before. Uh, what is it about Jackson that has you? I mean, obviously, we know he, he was really the architect of yeah. this Golden State team. Do you think he can he's replicate player, that in New York? He's a player's coach. He can relate to the players. And these days, that's what you need. You need a coach that can relate to the players, not just be a coach, but can relate to them. He's a player coach, and he can relate and understand when their body's hurting or when certain things, because he's played the game. He's understand those type of things. And he just knows, like, for me, to me, I think he'd just be the best fit over there at New York. Like he has a, he has a great, to me his 
the type of offense he runs, which is like a four, three and out, four and out, will be great for uh, Porzingis. And so you want to utilize that. And that's what you want to keep Porzingis there because when his his if you want to keep him there, you need a coach like Mark Jackson, a motivator. I think it would be a mistake to let him go yeah. or to trade him away. I mean, you have the superstar player. Tra- yeah, I think they're not going to trade him, but I think it's more of like when his contract up, he would leave. I think he would Now, leave. is he going to be a free agent after next season, I want to say? Yes, after next season. So 2019. Yeah. So obviously, this is a huge summer for the Knicks. Exactly. It's a huge summer for them. They have to make the right moves, and the right moves are – Look, some people think Kawhi Leonard, because he's still in New York, that he's going to probably go there. Those are great moves. I mean, that's going to keep him there. That's going to definitely keep Porzingis there. I think for the New York Knicks, you got to look at it. You think about the players that they have. you got to you got to keep Michael Beasley. I think he's emerged and he's played well. Give him another year contract. you got to keep Porzingis. That's the core. And then you go out and you can you, – look, you have a big enough – you have a big market at your – you know, the Madison Square Garden – is it's huge and everyone wants to play there and that's it's the mecca of basketball so you have to go with like the Kawhi Leonard you got to go over those big names and they can I think they can land one of those guys you know um they got to if they want to keep Porzingis 213-261-7491-213-261-7491 two nothing now San Jose on top of Vegas as they skate in the second period. Tampa Bay won earlier tonight over Boston 4-1. to one. Lightning now up two games to one. You've also got the Dodgers in action tonight taking on the Arizona Diamondbacks as well. And you have the Los Angeles Angels battling the Baltimore Orioles trying to uh, continue their winning ways as they picked up a W last night over Baltimore. I want to switch gears now and talk a little NFL and some of the uh, afterthoughts, if you will, from the NFL draft last week. One of the biggest stories that have come out of this draft was not actually what happened, but what it could have happened, and that naming the New England Patriots, Keith, potentially how it was rumored and it was confirmed now that they were trying to move up and select Baker Mayfield. They were trying to move up and do it. They were trying to package their two first-round picks Uh to give that and uh, probably some other stuff as well to the Cleveland Browns to try and get into that number one spot or to get into uh, the number two spot if Cleveland were to pick Sam Darnold. And this is interesting to me because, again, it's is it more so just Belichick trying to put stuff out there for people to, to get thinking about it and to maybe uh, have Cleveland select the guy that they were trying to covet? Yeah. Is it more so that, do you think? Of course. Yeah. Of course. Of course it is. I mean, look, Belichick makes certain moves, and you got to, you know, he does things. He plays mind games, and, and I think this is just one of them that he, he knows how to play, you know, and he gets he gets people thinking all the time, and uh, you got I give it to him. I think he's a great coach, and I think he knows, what he, he knows exactly what he's doing. He knows exactly how to make his certain move. And uh, and I'm hey I'm saying yes absolutely this is a, this is a move for like he's like a mastermind he's like a Phil Jackson Baker Mayfield's agent actually revealed this on a podcast this past week I believe it was Andrew Brandt's podcast uh, who works for Monday Morning Quarterback basically it was revealed that in their uh, discussions if you will Baker Mayfield's agent with different teams across the NFL when they were talking about who was going to draft Baker, where was he going to go. They, when, while talking with the Cleveland Browns, basically the Patriots franchise got name dropped, saying that there was some discussions with Cleveland and New England about possibly the Patriots moving up. It To me, the thing is, okay, if that would have happened, we know they would have given up both the two first-round picks, but they would have had to have given up something more than that yeah. to go all the way up to number I- one. And I don't think Baker Mayfield was the answer. Like, oh, I don't think so either. Like I've said before, I wasn't in love with any of these quarterbacks to yeah. the extent of how I think these are going to be franchise guys. I do think Josh Rosen will be the best, as I said yeah. last week. I think he'll be the best ultimately out of this crop. But I'm, I'm just not. I don't, I don't see the. There's no, there was no Peyton Manning in this yeah, draft. Yeah. Highly touted out of college. And again, it goes to what the Patriots are trying to do. They want to win now, and yep. they're not thinking future. 
And I even think, you know, when you look at that, then I think they made those right moves. You know, it took me a couple of days to really sit back. You asked me, uh, you asked me just a couple of days ago, what was my thoughts on the, the Patriots move? And I really couldn't give you a really sound, profound answer because I really hadn't really sat back and thought about, thought about it. But with, but with us conversating about it right now, it makes sense, like what we you said before, like they want to win now. And if they want to win now, then they got to fill those certain holes in order to win now. And so selecting uh, offensive lineman, a left tackle, and then selecting a running back, I mean, I think was a great ordeal, you know, what they did. So that's just going to put them to win now. However, I do still think that they got to find something to get it. They still got to find – I think they just need – everybody's like, oh, they need a quarterback, backup quarterback, backup quarterback. But for what? Like, honestly, Brady plays most of the snaps anyway, even in the preseason. So it's really – we got to get the most best protection for him now while we still got him where we can win now. And so, you know, I totally agree with their front office, what they're doing. I do think they still got some more holes to fill where – they got to get a rec- another stud receiver in there. They just have to. A receiver or a tight end. One of those they got to get if they're yeah. going to be successful. We talked about adding depth at the tight end position. This really wasn't the draft to do it. Outside of Mike Kosicki, the standout tight end from Penn State, who went to the Dolphins, there really was not a big tight end presence that you could look for, at least not where the Patriots were picking. It just was not on the board. When I look back at the Patriots draft and their picks – Again, with that mentality of this is a team who wants to win in the next year or two, they filled a lot of holes, at least on paper, with draft picks as are concerned. You talked about the offensive lineman out of Georgia, Keith. They need someone to fill in for Nate Solder. Again, with Dante Scarnecchia, the offensive line coach, again coming back and his ability to plug and play guys at, at such a quick rate, you got to love uh, his chances, uh, the new offensive lineman, to come in and probably start here in 2018. And, you know, they did pick a receiver late in the sixth round, if that does anything for you. Yeah. They, took, they did take a receiver out of Miami. It's not a, a highly touted type of receiver out of college who was on the big board, sort of say. Uh, but maybe they find, maybe they get a steal there in the late rounds. They have a maybe. history of stealing players in the later rounds. So maybe they get something there ultimately. But uh, it, they did take a quarterback in the draft at the end. They yeah. did take the quarterback out of LSU, Danny Etling, who... Who knows? They took him Insurance. in the seventh round at 219 overall. <laughs> you know, not exactly Mr. Irrelevant, but close yeah, towards the end insurance. of the draft. Like, yeah, all right, we'll get it back. We'll, we'll find somebody. But, I, I, again, it, they had the opportunity to take Lamar Jackson and Mason Rudolph out of Oklahoma State, for that matter, if Belichick really thought that these guys had a potential to come in and play in the next couple of years. He probably would have taken them at that point. I really believe that. Uh, but I, I just think that it just wasn't there for him uh, yeah. to take these guys. And at the end of the day, I, I don't think this is the draft that you're going to look back on if you're any of these teams, not just the Patriots, but any team who might have passed on a guy like Jackson or Rudolph and say to yourself, you know, man, we really missed out in 2018 in that draft. That was the draft that, yeah. man, you know what? They had the quarterbacks, and we just missed out on it. I, don't, it. I might be wrong, but I've, at the, at my feeling is, my inkling, I don't think we're going to see that and think about that when we look back on this draft in history. Yeah. Well, see, this is the thing. Like, this is the thing we're really like, we were talking about what scratches my head about the Patriots. Like, I'm reading this thing and saying Danny Shelton that they have five years. They didn't pick up his option for five years. They won't pick up his five-year option. Um, yeah, they're declining the it. They're declining it. So it really, it's really, like, to me, I'm like, what are they doing? Like, he's young. He's a young guy. He's done some good things. I'm like, why they're not picking him up? They're going to decline, so he's just going to go somewhere else. And it's just, I don't know. Hey, next man up. It is, but, uh, like, you know what? That only is going to help you for so long. You know what I mean? Like, it's only going to help you for so long. This Right now, they need the best product they can possibly have in order to win. And that's the thing. They're not going for future. They're going to win. They want to win now. And when you want to win now, then, you, look, <laughs> some of these guys you're going to have to pay up. Um, and, you know, I don't know. We'll just see. I don't know. I think they're Patriots are making more moves. We, we know that. They had to get younger this offseason. Yeah. They had to get younger. 
especially along the offensive line. It looks like they've done that right now so far. So we'll see. On the defense side of the ball, obviously you mentioned uh, releasing Shelton there. They have different guys they can mix and match. A lot of the criticism was, from what I heard in this draft for the Patriots specifically, is they didn't really take a defensive end. I think people forget, though, they drafted a DN last year in Derek Rivers, who was out the whole season with a torn ACL. They're going to get him back here in 2018. So they're, they're going to get production from the defensive end position, I feel, coming up uh, this year, which was one of the biggest down ter- downfalls of them last year. They couldn't get enough pressure on the quarterback from that yeah. position. Yeah. From that position, especially with Ninkovich retiring in the preseason. So you get a guy like Derek Rivers who comes back here and uh, his first full year in the NFL with the Pats. I think you plug him in. And they drafted some guys to play at linebacker as well. So they think they got younger in the linebacker core, especially with the uncertainty of Hightower and his injury history over the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. He looks like he's a player who is kind of uh, projecting more towards a player who has a shorter career due to injuries. Now, who knows? That could change. But it looks like he, I mean, he has missed a lot of games here in the yeah. early portion of his career. He's more of a physical type of linebacker, too. That's that's a beating of a position yeah. on the body. So I, I don't know. They obviously are, are maybe taking that into account, drafted some linebackers, like I said. Overall, again, when I sat back and think about it, uh-huh. I, I think it was a good draft for them. It really was. What grade would you give them? I, I, I'm going to have to say – I'm going to go with you. You said a B plus. Yeah. I would have to agree with that because a B – I don't think really fully justifies it. An A minus, they weren't. It wasn't that good. At least time will tell if it was that good. I would say a B plus. Again, they filled a lot of holes here. I really like the Sonny Michelle pick, yeah. the back out of Georgia. Again, look at his highlights from the playoffs last year, and especially what he did in the Rose Bowl. This guy can run all over defenses. Small back, but really is quick. Kind of really. He could morph into like a Darren Sproles type of player, I feel, especially if he, he gains a little bit of muscle yeah. and gets a little bit bigger. Quick quick guy out of the backfield. I really like that one a lot. And um, he actually was roommates with uh, Isaiah Wynn, the offensive lineman they took out of Georgia. So there's some what of a camaraderie between those two. You have to like that. And, again, if a lot of these guys can pan out in the later rounds who they picked, especially on defense where they needed to shore some things up, especially in the secondary. Uh, this is a team that uh, really, once again, uh, as Vegas has said, they're projected. Vegas is actually putting them at 11 wins for 2018, which is down. They've won at least 12 games in, I think, seven straight years, seven or eight straight years now. So Vegas has them hovering around that mark. But, again, if these young guys can develop quicker versus later – I think they're right on par to get to that win total again in 2018. But, um, again, they uh, it's uh, with Brady, obviously, they don't have a lot of depth at quarterback. That no. goes without saying. Uh, but I guess it, it, if Brady goes down, you're not winning anything anyhow this That's year. True. So the only exception would be Garoppolo if he's still on the roster. Then just, he, just hang it up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I would give it a, a good mark here for the Patriots. I got to say, Keith, I think a lot of teams did a lot of good for themselves in this draft overall, if you think about it. If you look around the what NFL. What about the Cleveland Browns? They didn't maximize. <laughs> they did not maximize their overall talent. There's no way you can convince me that the Cleveland Browns maximized the unique situation they were in to yeah. pick not once but twice in the top five. Yes. Can't do it. Yeah. Baker Mayfield might turn out to be – a great quarterback in this league. Yeah. And Denzel Ward may turn out to be a shutdown corner. But right here, after just about a week removed from the draft, you can't tell me they maximized that value. To me, the way they would have done that would have been taking Saquon Barkley number one because you're assured, you're assured at that point to get either Darnold, Rosen, or Mayfield at four. Yeah. That would have maximized. And considering the fact that there wasn't much separation from much of the uh, experts out there of a difference between Mayfield, Darnold, or Rosen, that's even more reason why I would have took Barkley number one. But they decided not to do that, and probably a big reason why Dorsey was just gung ho on the quarterback was they haven't been able to get that position right in so long. Yeah. In so long. So there, there, there was a sense of, uh, you know, Dorsey wants to get off on the right foot. He's inherited 
the past with this team and, and their inability to get a franchise quarterback. But, Stu, there's pressure because of uh, their lack of having success at that position. I have to say this. I, I'm just thinking about this, too, because we're, talk, we're talking about in terms of, like, the Cleveland Browns and they're great. What about the Cincinnati Bengals? Though? What do you think about their draft picks? And to me, like, I w- I'm going to say this. I'll say this to you, Brad. It doesn't matter what they pick because as long as Marvin Lewis is the coach, it doesn't matter. I don't care how good or how many players they pick up, how they did in the draft. It doesn't really matter because the bottom line is if Marvin Lewis is the coach, they're not going to move forward. I'm just, to me, it's just that's the thing about when I look at them. I'm looking, you, we grade all the, they grade all every team, how they do in the draft, how this and that. And yeah, Cleveland Browns, they probably didn't do the best picking in the draft. Really pissed me off that they didn't select Saquon Barkley. I, and to me, it's and just, you're not I'm even a Browns fan. I'm not even a Browns fan. You don't fan. even know anybody who's a Browns I'm fan. I'm just dumbfounded that it's just to me, like, some things are just obvious and you should do. And you're like, okay. It didn't settle with me well. And then I'll go back and you look at, like, the Cincinnati Bengals. Cincinnati Bengals probably had a decent draft pick. They had a decent draft. But the fact remains is it's the coaching. They got a Marvin Lewis as a coach. I just – nobody's a believer in him in the, in the, in the NFL. I mean, not going to say NFL. But no sp- – analyzer. everybody says the same thing, that he should be out. Every – you go to every radio station. Put it like this. If you had a poll, you threw a poll up today – he said, should Marvin Lewis be the Cincinnati Bengals coach in 2018-19 uh, season? Most of the people would say no, and that would be about 90%. Oh, that's a given. That's a given. Of course not. Of course he hasn't won anything there. He has not won anything. And it just goes he's, back. He's hurt. the longest tenured head coach, second longest actually behind Belichick, second longest. I think he's been there since 2003. And, and it reflects like they got great talent on that team. They just they do. don't have a coach. Not a disciplined football team. And they haven't been now for at least since that wild card loss where they just absolutely just threw up on themselves with Vontez Burfick just being an idiot. And yeah. just they've been they've been a very undisciplined football team since that point in time. Honestly, they missed their window. When yeah. they had a couple of years ago when Andy Dalton first came into the league. When he was there, his second and third year, that was their window when A.J. Green was in his prime for them really to be able to put this team over the top and make some noise in the AFC. And they just didn't do it for one reason or another. But, yeah, you know how I feel about Marvin Lewis. They're not going to win anything. They are not going to scratch that divisional title in the AFC North. And Pittsburgh still owns them yeah. in that division uh, until uh, they, they get some fresh blood in there. I think they need it. But as far as their draft goes, yeah, they get the center out of Ohio State uh, with their first pick, and they shored up a couple different things. A lot of teams went O-line in this draft, which is very interesting to me. And I think teams are just seeing that, especially what the Eagles were able to do last year with the back of quarterback riding them all the way to the Super Bowl championship. If you have your line set and you can block and protect your quarterback up front, regardless of who that quarterback may be, as long as they're competent and get, can get the ball out uh-huh. and can protect the football, if you have protection up front, you can win or at least put yourself in a chance to win. So I think a lot of teams are taking a page out of the Eagles' book in that sense with offensive line. So I thought that was interesting. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, Cincinnati, again, they, they, did, uh, they did okay for themselves. A couple of guys actually out of Ohio State, they took the DM, Sam Hubbard. They took him in the third round. Uh, a lot of different guys here. So... Uh, they pick smart. A lot of teams pick smart in this draft. Uh, I thought uh, Pittsburgh was very smart in drafting Mason Rudolph. Uh, I thought that was a great pickup for them, considering the fact that they have so many weapons, as we've talked about for so long here on the show on that offense. If Ben, we know he's been contemplating retirement the last year or two, if he does decide to hang it up in maybe one or two seasons from now, Mason Rudolph, if he's competent, he's going to walk into a great situation. Yeah. A great situation. So I thought that was a great pickup for the Steelers. As we look around to some other teams, obviously the Denver Broncos and the AFC, they stand out by taking Chubb. Uh, towards the beginning of the draft there, kind of teaming him up with Von Miller, trying to maybe go back, Elway is, to what they did a couple of years ago when they won Super Bowl 50 with a a ferocious defense and and an offense that was able to just kind of protect the football. Although I think they they really have to give a lot. they got to get a lot more production from 
the offense, especially um, Case Keenum in that quarterback position. They're not going to be able to replicate what they did a couple years ago. I said that before, right? That was a once in a, a lifetime type of a, a defensive output. And um, although I like this pick, I think Denver needs more than just that uh, to really compete with the top dogs this year in 2018. So they did good, though, in this draft. And uh, there were some other teams as well that did a good job. To me, the biggest risk takers again were the Cleveland Browns taking Baker Madoff, yeah. uh, Baker Mayfield rather, uh, number one overall because high risk, high reward. Yep. And then you get Denzel Ward there at four. Like I said, I mean, maybe he turns out to be a shutdown corner, but uh, it, it's another risk as well to take a guy like that so high. So a lot of teams played it safe. Cleveland, they were the risk takers in 2018. Yes, I have to agree to you all the way. I mean, when you start looking at it and, and you look at the other teams and things are going on with them, I mean, it's hard to say and who else is would be a risk taker because everybody else has been pretty much successful yeah. this whole season. <laughs> right. <laughs> and it's like, you know, you hit it right on the money. They are the risk takers, but I just still think that's the problem with them. They're, they're risk takers every year, and they're – so they haven't, they're selecting the wrong players. They, they're not selecting the obvious. It, it just kills. I, I, I'm just dumbfounded that they didn't select Saquon Barkley because I'm like, let's think about this. Yeah. How the Giants are going to do this year with a Saquon Barkley? Well, we know this. He's immediate. He's an immediate person to insert in right away. Is Baker Mayfield going to be that? No, you can't insert Baker Mayfield right away. He's not going to be inserting him right away. You got Tyrod Taylor there. The only one is Ward. We don't know how he's going to do. We don't know how he's going to beat out. He'll probably start because they have to have a corner and they need one. He'll probably start in this and that. But it was, to me, you need what's going to help you, I think, to get better immediately. And they don't. They have a lot of holes still to fill. I just think what they have to say, if you look at their roster and you look at what they have around them, they have Jarvis Landry, you got you got Josh Gordon coming back, you got Tyrod Taylor, those right there, a running quarterback who can who can throw on the run. But you got separate you got guys like Josh Gordon who's gonna get doubled, Jarvis Landry who was the number one receiver, who's gonna jump, but those are guys who can make separation. And they're just, just missing what now in offense? Running back. Bingo. And it just kills me that that was the one to get. To me, for years to come, that was the guy to get. If you look at what he was doing, it's just it's a no brainer. The the quarterbacks were still going to be there at the end of the day. That's what I've been saying all Dude, along. Ward was going to be there at the end of the day for the next big. I mean, right? No one's talking Ward, but I don't know. Maybe they see. Maybe he's got some little Bill Belichick ism ism in him, and he sees something we don't well, see. Uh, I don't know about that yet. But I will say that if you don't have a franchise starting quarterback in this league and you are desperate to get one and you have not been able to hit on that position in such a long time, it can make you do some crazy things, Keith. It can make you overthink things, take wrong guys at wrong spots when maybe they should be picked a little further down in the draft. John Dorsey, brand new GM there. He, he wants to get off on the right foot. I, I think this really comes down to him putting his stamp on this franchise with his quarterback. This is his quarterback. It will go down in history that John Dorsey selected Baker Mayfield first overall for the Cleveland Browns in the 2018 NFL Draft. That's his legacy. The jury is out on how that will play out ultimately, obviously. Uh, but he has hitched his wagon to him. I think they fell in love with him. Uh, when they met with him uh, pre-draft, and they liked everything they saw. Obviously a lot of upside, but again, a a high risk at that point when you could have had a Sam Darnold out of USC, you could have had a Josh Rosen as well, Uh, or again, you could have got Baker Mayfield along with Saquon Barkley. So again, we're just going to hit the beat on this, and I I think Cleveland is going to look back on this draft and say they, there's no way they're ever going to look back and say we fully maximize those two picks. Even if Mayfield is a phenomenal starter, franchise quarterback in this league, there's no way you're going to be able to say they fully maximized it because I think Saquon Barkley is going to have a great career with the New York Giants. Yeah, he's going to have a great career 
they definitely selected their. They definitely got the right pick. They hadn't, like I told you, they hadn't had a running back since Brandon Jacobs. Yeah, and and I think they got that component. I think they got it right. Um, I think they're also they're, they're working on their line, um, and uh, you know they're they're trying to get back into like their winning ways because look they. Look, they're going to stick with Odell Beckham. I think they're going to give him another shot, which is obvious. But, uh, you know, they just need to get that protection now. You know, they need to get that protection for the Saquon Barkley to, to, to be able to run up the middle because that's the type of guard. He's a he's a run-up-the-middle type of guy. Um, he's, he's a physical running back, and he likes to run up the middle. And he doesn't – you know, he's not really the best as – running sweeps and things like that he he loves he can do it but they ran they ran some of that at penn state but yeah i, I get what in you're saying league, it doesn't league, work yeah, it's not going to work in the league especially with these guys so i can see them running up the middle a lot more so he's going to get a lot more stronger i think that's what he's working on but in order for that to happen they got to have a line that's going to be able to open those holes for him and so unless he's not going to be effective at all and like so, you said, they they fill that hole uh, with the the young kid out of UTEP, yeah. uh, who they're raving about. Yeah, uh, they're really raving about him, and so he'll come in and potentially another plug and play type of a guy. You're right, though. Barkley's going to get stronger. I look at him as just uh, going to be a beast in the red zone. And then look goal at line situations schedule. that that is going to be brutal to sl- try and slow him down. And their schedule is not is not an easy schedule. They got the Jaguars. They're going to play the Texans. They're uh, going to play the Saints, the Panthers, the Eagles. I mean, their division alone is tough, you know. So and you know, so they're you know the the good thing is the preseason to get their feet wet against the uh, the Browns and the Lions, the Jets. They'll have they'll be tested with the Patriots and see what they do. But that's going to be the last one of the season. But they got a stack pretty. They got a stack schedule here, and it's not going to be easy for them. I don't see any light games for the Giants at all, except for. I'm not going to say the Bears, the Colts, maybe the easiest. I'll be honest with you. I'll say the easiest may be the Dallas Cowboys. That may be the easiest game for them. That's crazy uh, when you think about it. Because I mean, that's that's still a challenge in itself with the talent there that the Cowboys and have. And the rivalry, <laughs> right? And the rivalry. Not to mention that they do have a tough schedule. When the schedules came out a couple weeks ago, we I remember kind of maybe taking a peek at that one, and it did look a little daunting. And I, I think the biggest problem the Giants could have in 2018 especially going into the season is a bit of a false sense of where they're at right now I think the fans are and I I love Barkley as much as anybody I think he's going to have a great great career but he's not going to take you to the promised land in 2018 no so I they think they're trying to go for it here in 2018 and 2019 and it's not a Reggie not Bush there. coming out of his rookie year. No, and, the and, Saints, and they're not even all, they're not at Philadelphia's level at all. They're not even close to that. So I they they it was a great pick by taking Barkley, uh, but they still don't have a long term quarterback solution. One I really believe I think Eli's got two more years at, at a high level in this league, maybe three. Mm-hmm. But uh, again, it's. You can't blame them at all for taking Barkley. Uh, you know, they don't get the quarterback here. They'll probably go for it next year in the draft. Um, but, again, I, this is not this is a team that won three games last year. Yeah. I don't think they're going to win ten games in 2018. I look for them maybe to be more of like an eight and eight, nine and seven football team. That's what I think. I think they'll improve. But they're not the Philadelphia Eagles yet. They're yeah. nowhere near. The Philadelphia Eagles really have no holes at all on their team. Yeah. So uh, there, it's a division that the Giants um, maybe they're as good as the Cowboys. It's close. I'm not sure who's better. So you say that's the best team. Those would be the, that's gonna be a little battle at the bottom, the bottom of the barrel. Well, no, the bottom of the barrel is probably the Washington Redskins in in the NFC East at this point. Yeah. I, I think they're probably uh, the, the, especially with Alex Smith coming over. I, I don't. I'm not a big fan of that transition. Smith to Washington now working on his third yeah. team. I don't see him going into D.C. and lighting it up, sort of say. So they have major question marks there. Uh, Jay Gruden is going to be coaching for his life this season. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I just I think they're probably the, the fourth 
fourth best team, last team there in, in the East. And yeah, you have the Giants. My point is the Giants are more so on a level of Dallas at this point. They're not the Philadelphia Eagles. They're not at that level yet. Yeah. And with all the great teams and how well, as we've talked about here on the program before, how well improved the NFC is as a whole in the conference, uh, it's, again, the Giants, good moves here, but this has not propelled them to one of the top teams in the conference. No, no, absolutely not. Um, they're definitely not the top. They're the, on the lower tiers yeah. coming in. Um, but there's no one stopping. I think the Eagles are they're the cream of the crop right now at the top of the list. And um, you know, I'm gonna say that I'm 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 gonna say that in that uh, it's they're just there's nobody beating them, not in that division. The Eagles. No, no, I don't think so. Yeah. I think teams like as we talked about can beat them in the conference, yeah. but that division, no, I, I don't. I'd be really surprised. I mean, in in one short season, in one off season. If a team like the Giants or even the Cowboys can surpass them this year, I'd be floored. Yeah. I mean, borrowing any more kind of injuries, although we've already seen they can sustain and uh, be able to get through injuries to the quarterback, I'd be amazed if that happens in just yeah. a, such a short turnaround. Yeah. It's Behind the Mic. We're live here once again from Grunion Sports Bar and Grill. We'll take a break, and we'll come back on the other side for our final segment. Our final segment as Kyle Kuzma is live on the set of Inside the NBA tonight on TNT, Keith. Getting a little purple and gold representing on Inside the NBA. So it's Behind the Mic. Once again, BehindTheMicShow.com. And you can also listen on the Behind the Mic app. Everybody buckle up. Buckle up. Let's go. Buckle up. Can we go to the store? Buckle up. Everybody, buckle up. A lot goes on in the car, but you're in control. So only move when you hear the click that says they're buckled in. Never give up until they buckle up. Learn more at safercar.gov slash kidsbuckleup. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Dave, what are you doing? Just sending a gift to Dave2037. Who? Me in the future. I save a little money from every paycheck as a gift to Dave2037. So you can spend it on things like anti-gravity boots or a hologram Doberman. Something cool like that. I think Dave2037 deserves it. He worked hard. What are you getting Steve2037? I guess I was thinking Steve2037 would just fend for himself. Well, all right. But don't expect to be borrowing my anti-gravity boots. You want to have money in your future? You got to start saving now. Putting some money from every paycheck into a savings account or contributing to your 401k can make a big difference later. Put away a few bucks, feel like a million bucks. For free ideas and easy ways to save, go to feedthepig.org. That's feedthepig.org. Hey, let's just hope Steve2037 doesn't get his hands on a cold time machine because he is going to come back here and knock some sense into you. This message brought to you by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants and the Ad Council. We all come together and stand together to serve our veterans. We invest in the latest technology. We take the time to train the next generation of doctors and nurses. We work together to make sure we heal their bodies and their minds. This is our mission. More than 300,000 of us working as one, together with families and loved ones. No matter where they live in this country, we'll be there. We stand strong, united. Stand with us in caring for our veterans. Everybody buckle up. Bum, 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 bum. Buckle up. Let's go. Buckle up. Can we go to the store. Come on, buckle can we get up. Some ice cream? Come on, come on, come on, come on. Everybody, everybody, buckle up. A lot goes on in the car, but you're in control. So only move when you hear the click that says they're buckled in. Never give up until they buckle up. Learn more at safercar.gov slash kidsbuckleup. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. I'm more resourceful than I thought. My suit can still make an impression. My video games are still game changers. And my lamp can bring others a bright future. Because when I donate my stuff to Goodwill, it helps fund job placement and training for people right in my community. Now my stuff gets a second chance. And will give someone in my community a second chance too. Goodwill. Donate stuff. Create jobs. Find your nearest donation center at Goodwill.org. That's Goodwill.org. This message brought to you by Goodwill and the Ad Council. Hi, I'm Danica Patrick and proud aunt. Watching my nieces grow, play, and learn is amazing. But not every child gets to be carefree. 
One in six kids in the U.S. are hungry. One in six. That little girl sitting alone at the playground, she can't play like the other kids. She doesn't have the energy because she's hungry. School lunch will be her only meal today. It breaks my heart that this is the reality in our country, but it's something that Feeding America is working to change. Each year, the Feeding America network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste. This food is then provided to families and children in need. Being a kid should be about using your imagination, learning, and having fun. These children shouldn't have to miss out on simply being a kid because they're hungry. To find out how you can help end childhood hunger in your community, visit feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Our military service members volunteer to protect us in the most dangerous places around the world. They step up. And when they are severely ill or injured, returning to their families is only the beginning of their long road home. Beyond all the hospitals and doctors and surgeries they need just to survive, they also deserve whatever they need to truly live. All the in-home care and day-to-day -day help they need to live independently, on their own terms. Wounded Warrior Project long-term support programs were established to provide these brave men and women whatever they need to continue their fight for independence at no cost for life. So many of them need us, and it's time for a grateful nation to step up. Find out how you can do your part at findwwp.org. This is Behind the Mic with Brad Dalius. Take us with you on the go. Download the official Behind the Mic app today. You can always listen online, BehindTheMicShow.com. Check out our podcast on iHeartRadio. On the Major League scoreboard tonight, it's one nothing Dodgers on top of the Diamondbacks. They're headed to the 7th right now in Phoenix. You have the Angels beating up on the uh, Baltimore Orioles 7-1. to The Angels, they need a bad tonight. That's a yeah. good bust-out performance from them. Kind of uh, clear the air a bit on... Uh, some of their struggles as of late, so it's good to see him put up a seven number. Uh, the Dodgers, though, tonight, Hyung Jing Ryo got the start. He actually left the game in the second inning with a left groin strain, so the injury bug, which has been deadly here in the first month and going into May, the second month of the season for the Dodgers, continues to sting this team. Uh, so Ryu is done, so they had to dive into the bullpen. Pedro Baez came in and pitched, and actually, not bad tonight, Keith. Uh, Baez goes two and two-thirds. He only gives up a couple of hits, zero earned runs, I may add, uh, which is huge. That's been a, a tough spot for him. He has just, uh, been brutal for this team, no way around it. So he, a good couple of innings of relief work today for Baez. Uh, Hudson comes in and pitches two innings. He's currently in there now. Uh, so the bullpen being worked tonight uh, for the Dodgers, but uh, so far so good as they're pitching a shutout, as I said, against Arizona. And they need this victory tonight. They really need a bad. Yeah. They lost the first two games of this series, Keith. It's a four-game set in Arizona. They wrap it up tomorrow. But they really need to get on the board in this series tonight. Cody Bellinger doing his part. A couple of hits tonight. A ribby for him. Matt Kemp with a hit tonight as well. Muncie, he gets a hit over at third base as he starts tonight. Uh, Kiki Hernandez. Working the counts as well. And Chase Utley, uh, you know, the ageless wonder continues to... They're asking a lot of, uh, of him here in the first month of the season. I was actually curious to see how much they were going to use him this year. They, they brought him back, obviously, on a two-year deal, which I was surprised to see in the offseason. And uh, when we talked with Dustin Nosler at the beginning of the season from Dodgers Digest, uh, it, was, it was thought that Utley was going to be mostly a clubhouse morale-type guy. Let's get him fired up in um, the dugout before the game, during the game, after the game. But he has played a lot for them here at second base so far, just a month into this 2018 campaign. So uh, he's doing the best he can for this team. And we've talked, obviously, a lot about Matt Kemp and his ability to swing a hot bat. Cody Bellinger is going to be the guy I think they're really going to look at, Keith, in this lineup 
uh, to be their standout hitter. With Corey Seager out, they're going to look for him uh, to really come up and have nights like he's doing tonight. Three at-bats, two hits, like I said, drive in a runner here or there. And Yasmani Grandal, uh, he's gotten off to a very good start here in 2018, as I've said before. He's going to need to continue to do that. And you look at a guy like, we've talked about trade pieces before. How about a guy like Jock Peterson? He's played some center field here and there. He can play really anywhere in the outfield for this club. Yeah. This is a guy who maybe they would be looking to move at some point. He's batted well so far this year for him, for them. He's gotten some good hits. Again, maybe another trade piece. Could be, because I just think it, it changes a lot of things with Matt Kemp. I think you need to keep Matt Kemp at this moment in time because he's one of your hot bats at this moment, and that's what you desperately need. Um, but tonight's game, you can tell it's more of a defensive game is that what they're playing right here, and they're just trying to hold on. They're getting on the base, which is great, um, but uh, hopefully they can hold it off because, like you said, um, you know this series they desperately need it, number one. Number two is... I think you want to end this series with a uh, with a win. Uh, you got two more games left, and then you go to play San Diego, and it'd be great if you could get that winning streak on the road in San Diego, especially they're sitting at the bottom of the division. So um, this would be great for them if they could get these two wins right here. And then, like we said, we told you, well, I, I said it earlier. I said that the month of May is the most is, is very important for the Dodgers, and um, you know they got to have a, more, a lot more wins than losses in the month of May. So. Uh, hopefully they can start it off right right here and and get this win um but uh yeah they they the outfield play you know they y'all still please out you know you have guys that are out and you need guys to step up so if, if, if you got to move some guys you got to move them you know you got to move them around but i i totally agree with you uh that he may be a trading piece he may be a trading piece for them that's what they would need uh, but absolutely, I can say this now: Matt Kemp it can't be that trading piece. You got to keep him. Two one three two six one seven four nine one two one three two six one seven four nine one. It's interesting, yeah. With obviously the turn of events of all the injuries, Puig being on the DL now as well. Perhaps you're right, Keith. Maybe they need to hold on to Kemp. We'll see. But it's going to be important, obviously, for them to continue to to swing these hot bats. Shohei Otani back in the lineup tonight for the Angels. He scored a run. He actually was the DH this evening uh, as the Angels are up, as I said right now, 7-1 to one in the fifth, just the fifth inning, uh, down in Anaheim over the Baltimore Orioles. It's important. Uh, Simmons with a couple of hits tonight. It's important that they continue to, as we talked about last night, you got to beat up on teams that are bad. Yes. Baltimore, 8-21, and 21, bad baseball bad. team. Bad. And again, for them, their whole thing is they're trying to see where they lie. They played the top tier, please. They played the Boston. They played Boston. They played uh, New York. They played. They're going to play Houston Astros, or they they already played them, and they haven't done well against them. Those those teams. But one thing about them, they're trying to find place. They got to beat up on the teams that are not be, or that are not as good as them, and they those are must wins. And if they can stay that point. Then when they get to the New York Yankees, well, they'll have another shot at it again, but they'll be on the road that maybe they can get them in two or three games, and then that can help them, and that can kind of catapult them and hopefully win against in the postseason because that's the really imprint of, like, how they're going to do. you gotta be, you got to beat the top-tier teams, and right now the Yankees are high. So, uh, you know, they lately, you know, in the beginning, people have been booing them and this and that, and now – we are who we we are who we thought we thought they were, pretty much. Yeah. Speaking of the Bombers, right? Four nothing tonight. They shut out the Houston Astros. Big solid pitching performance from Luis Severino. He goes the complete game nine innings, only gives up five hits. That's pretty damn impressive, Keith. Yeah. Against this Astros starting lineup, to only give up five hits, a complete the World game Series shutout. champs. Yes. The World Series champs on top of that. So, um, but yeah, uh, you know the Angels are doing a great job with their. You know, keeping their head above water right now, um, but you know, it's just about for them. I think it's more of like we we said this earlier. I think it just goes back to it: it's consistency. You got to have consistency from them. They got to, they can't go on a deep end. And it's the same thing with the Dodgers too. It's consistency, getting a, a multiple amount of wins. They have to get a little bit. More, they have to get chunks of wins. And if they can stay like that and get accustomed to winning, 
honestly, they will now have figured it out, found that formula to what's what's helping them win games, and that would catapult them above those top tier teams as well. well. I agree. I completely agree. And if there's talking about well, yeah, the Angels. I mean, if they can follow that formula, absolutely, they'll get on the right track. With the Astros, one of those teams who are obviously in the driver's seat in the American League, if there has been somewhat of a um, you know a smudge on them, if you will, in the first month or so of the season, it's been Dallas Keuchel in the starting rotation. He's one and five. He takes the loss today, seven innings, three earned runs, not bad, but he just has not had the luck and uh, the fortune of some of these other pitchers, like a Charlie Morton, like a Justin Verlander as the Yankees were able to get to Keuchel tonight. But uh, that's a big win for the Yankees of going down there and beating Houston because at this point, Stu, the road looks like it goes through the Houston Astros in the American League. Uh, unless the Yankees can continue to play at this high clip and they're able to turn the tide, we shall see. But a good win tonight here on May the 2nd for the Yankees. Again, 4 nothing over the defending champion Houston Astros. In the NHL, we already know what happened earlier this evening. That would be the Tampa Bay Lightning defeating the Boston Bruins 4-1. to It's now 2-1 in favor of the Lightning in that series. And the magic is not there tonight, at least so far, for the oh. Golden Knights uh, through two periods in San Jose. 3 nothing Sharks. They Man. do have 20 minutes to play, but as of right now, San Jose is shutting the door. They are. They're trying to figure something out, and you know what's going to be scary? is There's, there's a possibility they're going to tie this series up. You yeah. Know? And, and if they tie this up, then, you know, I think what they've shown is, hey, the Golden Knights are not untouchable. We can, you know, they've been playing well, and um, and the San Jose Sharks have figured something out, obviously, for them to to get up on this team, you know. So uh, it's great to see these two battle it out, and this may be a this is a true test for the the Golden Knights, I think, right here. If they get beat today, uh, tonight, and uh, and it goes series two two, now that pressure's on them. It's going to be interesting to see how they come up because they've never been in this situation before. This is the first time. So how do they re- overcome adversity is what's going to be interesting to see with this team. Um, do I think they can do it? Absolutely. They're, they're just capable. I'll say this, man. It's 3-0 now, and maybe I say San Jose's probably figured something out. But this team, remember, has put up seven goals in the game before. And they can put up goals within in the heartbeat, in the second. So, you know, I'm not counting them out. They got another, again, they got another uh, another quarter to go. And um, I'm not counting them out, though. I'm, I, I, I can go back, like you're saying, like you said earlier, it could go into overtime, it could not. Yeah. With the way they play and how fast they can score, you know, it's going to be for for the San Jose Sharks. They got to continue to put the you know put the pe- um, put their foot on the gas pedal and just keep playing aggressive because that's how you're going to beat the Golden Knights. It's not you cannot hold back and kind of play defensive game with them. You have to continue to play the way you've been playing, which offensively is aggressive in order to beat this team. It's very similar to the Houston Rockets Jazz Series from earlier with Utah keeping that pedal to the metal man all the way to the end because you just don't know uh, with a hot team like that and very, very similar obviously like you're saying here with this night squad, especially on the power play. If if you're going to self-inflict yourself with penalties, if you're San Jose, you're just asking for trouble yeah. because they can kill it on the power play. Uh, they've been almost uh, unstoppable, actually, on the power play in these playoffs. Uh, Vegas has been just almost scoring at will, and uh, they just don't need any of the extra help, obviously. So uh, this is true, but I would not be surprised in the least bit if they if they find a way to tie this up in the third. I would not be surprised. No, absolutely not. Like I said, they impressed me uh, when they played the San Jose Sharks the first game, in the, the first game of the uh, playoffs, and the way they jumped out and scored. That just shows you right there. This team is lethal. They're dangerous. They're a dangerous team. They pose a threat to a lot of teams, and they can score within seconds. So you have to play aggressive, and um, I'm pretty sure that's what the San Jose Sharks coach is telling them: is look, continue to be aggressive. Continue to, to win puck, to win free pucks, uh, and and that's how you're going to beat this team. You got to be physical. So we'll see. We will see. I think four three. I'm going to call it. I think they come back to win four three tonight. How about that? Uh oh, four three. That's a could be. I'm four not three in overtime. 
Awesome show tonight here from Grunions. Uh, we're back at it, obviously, next Wednesday, as we always are at Grunion Sports Bar Manhattan Beach. Tomorrow night, be sure to tune in. Kings Cove over in El Segundo, Toyota Sports Center, the official practice facility of the L.A. Kings. I know the fans are still licking their wounds over no more Kings, but you never know. Kings players sometimes are, are likely to show up over there. So it's a great atmosphere. If you've never been, maybe tomorrow night's your first time coming over to Kings Cove in El Segundo. We'll see you over there tomorrow night. For Keith, I'm Brad. Keep living the dream.